private property is essentially freedom. So, so one framing for this is life, liberty, property, right? Life is your future freedom. If I take your life, I've stolen your future freedom. That would be murder, right? Liberty is your present freedom, your ability to move about as you see fit, go where you please. If you take someone's liberty, you've incarcerated them, right? You've stolen their present freedom. And property is the fruits of your past freedom, the things you've accumulated through work or through trade that rightfully and justly belong to you because you did the work to create them. And so if you violate someone's private property, you're basically stealing the fruits of their past freedom. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the What Is Money Show. I am thrilled to have you here joining me on my mission to help shine light on the corruption of money. Now, if this is your first time listening to the What Is Money Show, I strongly recommend that you go back to episodes one through nine first, which lays a lot of the groundwork for many of the concepts that we explore on the show. These first nine episodes are my series with Michael Saylor and thousands of people have told me that this is the best podcast series they've ever heard, hands down, and that it was instrumental to their understanding of money and Bitcoin. So if you're looking to start uh, a deep dive into the nature of money, I don't think there's any place better that you can start other than episode one of this show. Now, a little bit about this show and how it makes money. The What Is Money Show is 100% sponsor based. So all of our revenues are derived from direct sponsorships. And I strive to be very selective about the sponsors that I work with, specifically only using sponsors that I use personally, and also choosing sponsors that have values which are well aligned to the values expressed on this show, such as freedom, education, self-sovereignty, etc. So what I'm gonna do now is a few ad reads right at the top of the show, and then I'll do a few more ad reads in the middle. And I hope you'll take the time to listen to them, as again, these are hand-selected sponsors, and I think you'll like what they have to offer. Today's podcast is brought to you by N. Wolf's Clothing. Wolf is the first startup accelerator dedicated exclusively to the Bitcoin Lightning Network. Four times per year, Wolf brings teams from around the world to New York City to work with like-minded entrepreneurs, pushing the boundaries of what's possible with Bitcoin and Lightning. The program is designed to help early stage companies achieve product market fit, develop their brand, secure early stage funding, and grow businesses that help fuel the global adoption of Bitcoin. So go to wolfnyc.com to learn more about the program or apply. Again, that's WolfNYC, W-O-L-F-N-Y-C dot com. Today, we are joined by Robert Breedlove, joining us from the UK. Uh, before I even begin to introduce our guests, I want to remind all of you who are joining us on Zoom, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, YouTube, uh, go ahead and start typing in your questions and we will get to as many of them as we can. So our guest, Robert Breedlove, is a Bitcoin-focused entrepreneur, writer, philosopher. Uh, we know him through Michael Saylor. He came to our gala honoring him in uh, Malibu. And uh, what also caught our eye was last month, he produced a viral video on Francisco's money speech in Atlas Shrug that uh, prompted a surge of interest in Atlas Shrugged and Rand's work. Uh, Breedlove is also the host of What is Money podcast and author of Thank God for Bitcoin, the Creation, Corruption, and Redemption of Money. A uh, self-described freedom maximalist, Robert advocates for the importance of freedom across all spheres of human action and calls Bitcoin a humanitarian movement exposing the greatest con in human history, central banking. Robert, thanks for joining us. Thank you. And thank you for that elaborate introduction. <laughs> so um, our audience always loves to learn a little bit about our guests' origin stories. Yours is interesting. Uh, growing up in Tennessee, were there any early influences that put you on your path to becoming one of the most prominent Bitcoin evangelists, if I can use that term? Um, sure. I guess I've always 
been freedom oriented, I guess by by birth. Uh, my report cards always read something like, "Robert's an excellent student. He does really, you know, he got really good grades." I always volunteered to be the one to read out loud first. I love to read, um, but but he has a distinct problem with authority. He he talks back a little bit, and he um, just resists authority. I don't know why I'm that way. There's just something in my DNA or my blood, I suppose. Um, and then I would also add that my grandfather was in war. He was in the Korean War. He was in U.S. Special Forces. And I learned a lot from him about just the evils of warfare. And uh, one adamant assertion he had on my life was that I was never to join the military under any circumstances. Interesting. And so I guess that laid some kind of foundation into wondering what that's all about. You know, why do we go to war? It doesn't seem to make sense. We work really hard to build all of this capital and civilization around us. Why do we go to war and then destroy it? It just seemed like a very self-destructive activity. And then I would also credit my mom. Um, I was a very curious kid. I was asking a lot of questions. I think I just exhausted her at some point. <laughs> and she was like, you just need to read. So any questions you have, you can find a book and it will give you the answers. And so she inculcated this habit of reading at a very young age. I'd say from probably the age of 11. First book I read on my own was Hatchet, which is about a, a boy, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, surviving in the woods. And um, I've just been reading, <clears throat> excuse me. You know, if there's one, if there's one constant, I would say among all of our guests that we have on this uh, podcast um, across so many different disciplines, it's reading books as a young person. And uh, you know, when I was a teenager, seventy um, percent of my classmates, my friends, were reading books every day, and that was just for fun. These weren't assigned. Today, that percentage is is twelve percent and probably dropping. Um, so that makes our challenge at the Atlas Society. Uh, we are promoting um, ideas that, when Ayn Rand expressed them in her novels, uh, they are not small books. So that's kind of how uh, how we get creative. You know, one of the other things that Ayn Rand said uh, was that. Religion is a uh, a kind of a primitive or precursor of philosophy. Um, and I also understand that growing up, your family was very religious, attending uh, Southern Baptist churches. Do you think that that religious upbringing also primed you to become interested in philosophy, to be looking for answers, not just about um, why we have war, what's the proper uh, way to organize a society, but also like what is right, what is wrong, what is the purpose of, of life, how should we treat each other? Um, perhaps. I should be clear. Actually, my, my, my mother wasn't super religious. She's much more of a scientifically minded person. Um, I, I, she'd probably describe herself as agnostic, but my aunt and uncle who I spent a lot of time with, um, they were very religious. So we went to church often. And then I went to church on my own in my teenage years as well. Uh, mostly for the social aspect, I think by my habit of reading took me initially into astrophysics. Those are some of the first books I really started to read. So 12, 13, 14 years old, I was reading like Stephen Hawking, Brian Greene, um, other astrophysical authors. And so at that point I had developed really an atheistic perspective. I, I thought religion was kind of a fairy tale, really. Um, but a useful fairy tale, I guess, right? It, like people needed a story to inhabit, uh, but I didn't take it seriously in a literal sense. However, um, my current views are that we do need a central orienting story. And perhaps religion was... Religions have been an attempt at that, like kind of a a collective software that we all plug into, you know, something to share and disseminate and evolve our cultural values. 
And maybe that software has some bugs in it, you know? I wish the Bible talked more about property, for instance. And th- there are many things in the Bible that that allude to that, you know? Um, talking about the, the problems with theft and deception, et cetera, et cetera. So I don't know how much that really influenced me, but more recently, actually in getting into Bitcoin, I've started to revisit Christianity and other wisdom traditions and religions through more of a, a pragmatic perspective. And I think it's important, you know, we're, we're, we are the animal imbued with rationality and that rationality seems intrinsically linked to the stories we tell, the narrative structures we inhabit. And, um, I guess the, you know, rationality is our ultimate tool, if you will, kind of like a meta tool. And I would also put money in this category. It's a, they are meta tools in the sense that they let us create more tools, right? When we collaborate at scale, we can produce more goods, we can innovate, um, and create more wealth and abundance and, uh, technology. So I do think there is, in that sense, you could almost say we're, we are religious animals. We need some mythology to guide us, um, but I, I don't know how much my religious upbringing really impacted my views on freedom. I think that was more, I would credit that in addition to kind of my natural inclination towards freedom, when I read the book, The Creature from Jekyll Island in my early 20s, that was, that's what really- On the bookshelf behind me. <laughs> yeah. It really gave me insights into what I think is the most malevolent institution and biggest scam in the world, which is central banking. But at the time- Again, this is my early 20s of 2005, probably. I guess I was 19, actually. I felt like I had found the problem in the world, but there was no solution to it. Mm -hmm. So I kind of just put it on an intellectual shelf and moved on with my life. And it wasn't until discovering Bitcoin, through which I discovered Austrian economics. Um, I had it before that. I had earned my master's degree in accounting and finance, studied a lot of economics, I'd been reading The Economist magazine weekly, but none of that is is based in Austrian economics whatsoever. And so in discovering Bitcoin and then discovering Austrian economics, I felt I had found the solution to the problem that was identified in The Creature from Jekyll Island. So that's what really set me up on this path. It's interesting um, when you talk about the need for narrative. Uh, Ayn Rand called art the indispensable medium for the communication of a moral ideal. And um, I think that the principles of objectivism, which she elaborated, systematized, categorized after her uh, her two magnum opuses, her um, Atlas Shrugged and, and The Fountainhead, uh, those principles are also dramatized in, in her fiction, in her art. Um, and so that's Really, we take a page from that at the Atlas Society in, in trying to find artistic ways to um, to communicate these ideas in a world where young people are not reading books uh, in the same way they were when when I was when I was growing up. So, um, speaking of books, uh, you recently did a show on Francisco's money speech. It went viral. Um, do Did I understand that you are or were reading Atlas Shrugged for the first time? And um, were you aware that the speech was in the book? Tell us a little bit about Ayn Rand and, uh, and how you discovered. Yeah, I'm sure uh, ashamed to say that the first time I read Atlas Shrugged was about a year ago. Um, so didn't Fine. Hopefully the Atlas Society had something to do with that. <laughs> you you d- certainly did. And also my conversations with uh, Euron Brook, I had him on the show. We explored uh, uh, Rand's essay, The Virtue of Selfishness. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's been recommended to me a thousand times. I don't know what took me so long, but I finally read it. And there was a weird moment, actually. I was uh, returning home from a flight. I actually wasn't reading the book. It was an audio book. I typically read, but for this particular book, the audio book was recommended because the voice acting is really good, which it is. And I had stepped off the flight. I had booked an Uber home. And as I'm sitting there on a bench waiting, 
a man walks directly into the center of my field of vision and he's wearing a suit, a green suit, and it's covered in dollar signs. I love up. it. And I was like, what in the world? This is, this is hilarious. And so I take a picture of him on my phone. I'm thinking about tweeting something about it. And then this very strange synchronicity occurred that right at that moment, when he walked in my field of vision and I noticed him, and I'm listening to this 64-hour audio book, the money speech began right at that moment. Just by wow. coincidence. And so I'm, and I, I think I had heard the money speech once before, years and years ago, but I didn't even connect the dots that it was from Atlas Shrugged. And so I'm listening to this, it's about a 15 minute speech in the audiobook. And it just floored me. You know, I've, I've spent years asking this question, what is money? And I had never heard such a comprehensive, elegant answer as what Rand wrote in that book. And so I, I listened to it probably five, six more times over the next few days, and I was just inspired. I'm like, this, something is here. This is very important. People need to know this. It's not enough to just read it. It's not enough to just do a video monologue of me reading it. Like we needed, I needed to put some art to it. And so uh, my creative director of the podcast, he's very talented, I asked him, for some help. I said, look, I need to get this speech in some type of artistic wrapper and put it on the channel and we'll see how it does. And, um, and we published it. We published it as the world's best speech on money. It mm -hmm. also, another weird coincidence for Bitcoin, we didn't mean to do this. It came out to a runtime of exactly 21 minutes and 21 seconds. Bitcoin wow. is a, a fixed supply asset of 21 million, which is just another weird thing that happened. And then it went, yeah, semi-viral. It did about a quarter million views in a month, which is pretty good for like a short form documentary, basically. Yeah. And um, yeah, I, I think anyone that is curious about the nature of money, that is the first resource I would point them towards. It's, it's, it's absolutely fantastic. So we're going to put that link in all of the chats. Um, also, we shall put the link to uh, the Draw My Life video that the Atlas Society did, My Name is Money, in which we we dramatized that um, as a character and uh, what where she came from, uh, what her struggles were, um, who's taking advantage of her, how we can resurrect her in her purest form. And then, of course, we also did my name is Francisco Danconia. Put that in the link as well. And we did My Name is Bitcoin. So those are all fun, short, short videos um, that people will enjoy. They, they all, I think, probably got about a million views each. So check them out. Um, so let's talk about how you discovered Bitcoin. So I understand it was Bitcoin first, then Austrian economics, and finally Ayn Rand. Yeah. So again, it was curiosity. My mom guiding me towards reading as a solution to my curiosity. Started out in the natural sciences when I was young. And then when I got into my later teenage years, uh, I was just very, I was very mystified, I think is probably the right word, by the economy. You know, people talking about stocks and bonds and all of these abstract financial instruments. I didn't understand what they were. I didn't, I couldn't fathom how the market actually worked and what it was. So I was like, I, I want to understand this. I want to learn how the world works. And so really started to dive into reading economics or what I thought was economics at the time. Uh, largely, it was The Economist magazine. I became a subscriber to that for years. I read it for years. I think I learned a lot um, reading that. It's a magazine. It's more of a newspaper than a magazine. And uh, covers a, a broad spectrum of topics. You know, they go into arts and sciences, finance, economics, et cetera. Really good writing. So I think that was that was engaging for me. Are you still uh, subscribing to The Economist? I'm not. No, no, no. <laughs> I, I, what a tragedy, years, huh? Years ago. Um, because I never... Another never institution gained. succumbed. That's right. I never gained... I never understood economics uh, for, as a result of reading that magazine, actually. I had Interesting. questions. And I think now, in retrospect, it's because it was all Keynesian. 
based effectively. And it, you know, that magazine as well didn't cover much Austrian thought at all. You know, they, they had a few sections, uh, used to do a, a column on Schumpter, who's not really an Austrian economist, but he kind of touches on some of the, the teachings of the school. And, um, so that was my, my, my current intellectual fascination for years and years and years. I was also reading economics newsletters and whatnot. That's what led me to the creature from Jekyll Island actually was, uh, I don't recall the name of it, but it was an economics newsletter that was issued once a week and it recommended that book. And, um, yeah, that's what got me started on that path. And then, um, I, you know, I graduated with a master's degree in accounting and finance. I went into the private sector. I was a CFO, mostly focused in tech companies for most of my career. And then I discovered, I heard about Bitcoin in 2014, but just sort of wrote it off like many people do. And it wasn't until the 2016, late 2016, I started to explore crypto, trying to learn about what crypto is. And in going down that rabbit hole, I just became increasingly aware that Bitcoin was the main, if not the only innovation in this entire space. And it was in 2000, April, 2018, I was fortunate to read the book, The Bitcoin Standard by Safety and Moose. Basically the weekend it came out, I think the weekend it came out, I ordered it and read it in two days. And it was at that point that I had connected the dots. I was like, okay. This is that when I read the book, The Creature from Jekyll Island, and came to the conclusion that there was no solution to central banking, I felt like in reading the the Bitcoin standard, I had identified that solution. We needed a digital gold. We needed a non-physical gold to solve the centralization issue. Gold is excellent money, but unfortunately, it lacks portability. So we had to innovate around that by centralizing the custody of gold inside of banks and then issuing bank notes or warehouse receipts on top of that to make gold a globally transactable currency. So in the very act of trying to scale gold as money, we got into this problem where we needed to trust banks and central banks to maintain full reserve, uh, full reserve banking. And that's not a an activity that any human is apparently capable of doing, All right? Every full reserve degenerates into a fractional reserve, and apparently every fractional reserve degenerates into a zero reserve fiat standard. And I think all of that is rooted in this technical flaw in gold that is just, it's physical and it's expensive to secure and move across space. So the a framing I like to, to use for this is, if money is an instrument for moving economic value or purchasing power across time and space, gold is really good at moving value across time. We all know that, right? Fine man's suit is worth cost the same in terms of gold as it did a hundred years ago. But it's really bad at moving purchasing power across space, so we needed that derivative instrument, the banknote, the gold-backed currency, to make it transactable and portable across space. But that got us into the centralization problem. So what we really needed to solve central banking is a non-physical gold, something that does not necessitate centralization to scale as a globally transactable currency. And so that was my light bulb moment. And um, uh, the Bitcoin Standard also introduced me to Austrian economics. And I've been going down that rabbit hole ever since. (laughs) All right. I have many more questions for you, but uh, we've got some really good ones coming in from the audience. So we're going to dip into those. My Modern Galt from Instagram. So good to see you again, my friend. Uh, He's asking, um, what do you think is the most common misunderstanding when it comes to property? Oh, wow. It's one of my favorite topics. Um, You know, the conventional idea of property is typically real estate, right? When you say, I own property, people think you mean you own land. And maybe the term, I don't know how the term got transformed into that, but private property is essentially freedom. So so one framing for this is life, liberty, property, right? Life is your future freedom. If I take your life, I've stolen your future freedom. That would be murder, right? Liberty is your present freedom. 
your ability to move about as you see fit, go where you please. If you take someone's liberty, you've incarcerated them, right? You've stolen their present freedom. And property is the fruits of your past freedom, the things you've accumulated through work or through trade that rightfully and justly belong to you because you did the work to create them. And so if you violate someone's private property, you're basically stealing the fruits of their past freedom. Another framing for this is, and this is a bit more abstract, but this is the one that really clicked with me, is that private property isn't a thing. It's the relationship between an owner and asset, right? It's like a legally acknowledged or a socially acknowledged uh, binding between an owner and an asset. And we, we have to codify this into the law so that there's recourse uh, if someone violates that relationship, right? If someone steals your car, you need to be able to call someone or uh, otherwise regain the, the, the asset that was stolen from you. And, you know, Mises has a great quote on this. He says, if history can teach us anything, it's that civilization and private property are inexorably linked, right? If we can't own the fruits of our own labor across time and use that to accumulate wealth and improve our position in life, then none of the other rights matter. None of the other freedoms matter. And Rand has a quote on this as well, right? That without right to life... The right to life is the only right, and the the only implementation of that right is private property. So, and without the right to private property, no other rights are possible. Exactly. So it's foundational to civilization itself, and I really think this is also the exclusive philosophical scope of government. I think government should only exist to preserve life, liberty, and property. I also don't think government needs to fund itself through non consensual. Exchange. I don't think it needs to steal from people through taxation and inflation. I think there's different ways to do it. There's ways to have governance structures that are consensual in nature. But the problem is that, well, the monopoly on violence has a lot of power, right? They can just sort of dictate to you what your tax rate is going to be, and you don't really have a seat at that negotiating table. And I think Bitcoin is interesting here because, well, first of all, it's uninflatable. So it it eliminates, it, its monetization would eliminate inflation as a revenue option for the state. And it's also very easy to conceal and move. So if a state were taxing you excessively or being excessively oppressive through regulation or anything else, you could take your purchasing power and move to a jurisdiction that treats you better. So I think it enables people to vote with their wallet and with their feet in a way holds the state more accountable to the preferences of citizens. If you are a business owner or manager, you should know these three numbers. 36,000, 25, and 1. 36,000 is the number of businesses that have upgraded to NetSuite by Oracle. NetSuite is the number one cloud financial system, which allows you to streamline accounting, financial management, human resources, and more. NetSuite turns 25 years old this year. That's 25 years of helping businesses do more with less, close their books in days rather than weeks, and to drive down cost. And finally, one, because your business is one of a kind. So with NetSuite, you get a customized solution for all your key performance indicators in one efficient system with one source of truth. NetSuite is everything you need all in one place. Right now, you can download NetSuite's popular KPI checklist designed to give you consistently excellent performance absolutely free at netsuite.com slash whatismoney. That's netsuite.com slash whatismoney to get your free KPI checklist. Again, netsuite.com slash whatismoney. Now I'd like to tell you about our sponsor, iCoin Technology. iCoin has just released a sleek new hardware wallet. Looks like a mini iPhone, a little touch screen and camera on it. Uh, The device has no Wi-Fi, no cellular connection, no GPS. It's a strictly physically cold hardware wallet. Uh, Like I said, it's got a high-res 3-inch touchscreen. It's got a camera for air-gapping the wallet. Uh, It's got optional Bluetooth compatibility. And it's really a a brand-new UI, UX experience for a hardware wallet, making it very accessible, easy to use, not intimidating. And as we always talk about on this show, the only way you can truly own your Bitcoin is by having it in self-custody. So you need a device like iCoin Wallet to truly own your Bitcoin. 
Go to iCoinTechnology.com today and use promo code BITCOIN23 for 30% off of this new sleek hardware wallet. You know, it's interesting. When I was interviewing uh, Michael Saylor, he told this story of an experience that led him to, primed him to understand the importance of, of Bitcoin. And it was that he had some... Uh, company or assets in, I think, Argentina. And like overnight, the uh, government decided to devalue the currency by 50% uh, or that they were going to do this. And he was scrambling to think, how am I going to get my property, my assets, my capital out of this country that just said they're going to take half of it um, by fiat? And, uh, and he was getting creative, he was thinking, well, okay, how about I take the money, I buy a yacht, and I sail it to America, and then I sell the yacht. Um, of course, that wasn't even uh, possible. So, uh, you know, Bitcoin does make it, it possible to do that. And there's a reason why um, Ricardo Salinas, who was our honoree at our seventh annual gala um, just a couple weeks ago, uh, is holding 60% of its liquid, liquid assets in, in Bitcoin. Um, yeah, I would put, I'd have another layer to your very eloquent, uh, description of property. I tend to also think of it as, as capital and, uh, you know, the, the socialists want to, um, nationalize, seize the means of, of production capital. And of course, there is capital that can be um, assets that, uh, you know, it can be monetary assets, but it's initially your capital is your, is your means of production. That's your mind. That's your reason. Um, and that's why I like to say that uh, as individuals, we are not owned and we are not owed. Um, and uh, thinking of ourselves as our first and foremost property, our, our minds, our bodies, and having um, having domain over those. That's All right. Said. If I could add something to that, actually. So, yeah, please. Um, we just did an episode on what is money in Argentina, actually. And that's a very telling sequence of events about the problems with fiat currency. Um, they basically destroyed, I think, five currencies in uh, the span of a few decades. They kept adding zeros and then issuing a new currency and chopping off old zeros. And um, yeah, I would encourage people to check that out. And property is also, it's what, what does Hoppe say? That the most human action is like the primary category and the, the second most important category is private property. And you can actually define communism, socialism, and capitalism in terms of private property. Communism is the institutionalized abolition of private property. The state owns everything. You own nothing. Socialism- And you will be happy. <laughs> and you will be happy by dictate. And socialism is an institutional, institutionalized policy of aggression against private property. And capitalism is an institutionalized policy of respect for private property and consensual transfers of private property via contract. So that like you can sort of wipe away all of the confusing intellectual philosophical debate about communism versus socialism versus capitalism if you just look at private property itself. Again, that's the point of government is to preserve that social institution such that we can deal with one another via consent rather than coercion. And if you if you want to go all the way to the bottom, I think, of the philosophical rabbit hole of property, I would just say that property is justice, right? If justice is people getting what they deserve, property is just people keeping what they earn. So that is people getting what they deserve, right? If you worked to create it or you traded for it through a consensual exchange, then you own it. You have full rights and exclusive control over that asset and the ability to exclude others from using it. So if you want a just society, it has to be capitalistic. Any, any degree of socialism or communism is inherently unjust when framed in terms of, of private property. And I think that is really important to emphasize because generally uh, people make arguments against 
communism that are economic and they're historic, and uh, those don't seem to have prevailed. Um, first and foremost, we must make the moral argument about why it is unethical and unjust. And um, without winning that fight, that, that's where Ayn Rand took her, her stand. I think that is why she is so reviled by the left is because uh, she challenged them on their supposed moral high ground um, and challenged not just uh, their you know track record, but also their their motives. And uh, you know, Hayek, one of my beefs with him, uh, and Rand's beefs with him is that he said that uh, socialism, communism, uh, well, at least they had lofty ideals. And uh, Ayn Rand was very adamant in pointing out the motivations of of envy, of entitlement, of greed properly under, understood as the desire for the unearned, um, and uh, saying, no, this is not necessarily some uh, idealistic venture, but in fact, it is um, it is power lust cloaked yes. in altruistic uh, in altruistic language. Um, all right, another good question from our dear friend Candice Morena on Facebook. Um, she is asking Robert, what would you suggest as must reads for a young adult? Oh, that is a very challenging question, especially. You know, the devil's in the details. Who is this young adult? What are they trying to learn? That's true. That's true. Um, yeah. I, if they if they like fiction, if they are readers. I've recommended this trio of books. I think they, they dovetail really nicely together. And it's a it's an inter interesting trio. The first one is the book Leela by Robert Persig. It's a he authored the book Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance, which he's very famous for. But 15 years later, he wrote another book called Leela, an Inquiry into Morals, and it's a it's a blend of like a fictional narrative plus some autobiographical elements where he's writing he's incorporating his own life into the story to some extent, and then it's also a philosophical treatise on metaphysics, and. Very well written book, and I guess the the punchline to it is that he viewed value as fundamental, like value as the fundamental reality. Um, very hard for me to make a synopsis of it, but I would encourage people to check that out. I also liked Jordan Peterson's Maps of Meaning. It goes into the nature of mythology and psychology and how interconnected they are. He kind of is talking about praxeology, which is the study of human action, without actually talking about it. So it's as if some of these uh, mythological structures from the past were kind of pointing at the importance of praxeology before it was formally, you know, defined and um, expanded upon by people like Mises. And then the third book is Human Action by Mises, which is you know, the magnum opus of, of Austrian economics, as far as I can tell. Um, I would read them in that order. Leela's the easiest read. Maps of Meaning is a very difficult read, but not as difficult as human action. Human action is extremely difficult. Um, I think Mises learned the English language in his 40s or 50s and wrote that book. So it's very, the way he uses English is incredible. Um, but, but makes it, makes for a difficult read. But I think if you read all three of them, it has this effect of kind of dissolving a materialist worldview. Like you really come to see this other side of reality, which I, I like to say that you can perceive the world as made of matter, or you can perceive the world as made of what matters, right? This, this domain of relevance and purpose and intention and value that we participate in. And I think those three books are, are really interesting when read together. And of course, Candace, as you might imagine, I would add to that, particularly if it's, you know, a teenager, uh, Anthem and give them our graphic novel uh, adaptation of that with um, artwork by Marvel Comics illustrator Dan Parsons, um, Red Pond, another graphic novel. Kids love graphic novels. Uh, and then, of course, um, I would add Atlas Shrugged. Being a teenager or a young adult is a, is a perfect time 
to take that on. All right. Also on Facebook, uh, Jack Stenner asks, Robert, do you think people are more prone to emotion than reason or has social media over exaggerated this? It's a great question. Um, I do think we are, we are emotional animals. There's no question about that. And I do think it's most effective. And perhaps this gets back to the importance of art that you really need to connect with someone emotionally, like connect with their heart before you're going to influence their mind. That's not, of course, this is a generality. There's some people that are more rational. They'll just kind of take arguments um, based on their merits. But it seems like if you're going to influence a large number of people, you really need some type of artistic veneer. You know, and this is why Atlas Shrugged is so amazing, right? It's a, it's a masterpiece novel it's it's entertaining it's engaging but you're also suspenseful yeah suspenseful uh just I, mystery I'm blown away. when i read that book i'm blown away that a human could write that basically truly truly yeah I, that i'd say and frank herbert's uh, do you're like right. did this come from from this person or you know it's just so out of this world I haven't read that one yet, but I really enjoyed the movie, so I will have to read that. Um, but so I, I would say to answer the question, I think we're at the surface more motivated emotionally. A lot of people are swayed uh, more easily by emotions, but I have a lot of faith in human rationality. Uh, or this is this is a again a meta tool that we've been developing across eons. Um, we, we take it for granted today that you know we can both run this open source software in our minds called English and have a, a rational discourse about other books that people have written. Um, this is not something that was easily done, you know, a few thousand years ago. Most people were illiterate actually before the inventing of the printing press, the invention of the printing press. And so I think it's something that we can keep improving upon. Um, and I do believe too that now that we're in the digital age and the liquidity of ideas and information is unprecedented, that rationality will become a more and more important feature of human beings. Like when I look at young people today, especially digital natives, they're many are highly intelligent. You know, they, they've been they grew up tapped into this distributed information network called the internet, and. Um, their cognitive development reflects that. You know, I, 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 who knows what the long run consequences are? Maybe the internet's somewhat of a, an intellectual crutch, but I like to think optimistically that having access to that much information um, sort of accelerates the truth discovery process, right? It's creating more of a free market for ideas rather than a top down uh, media paradigm as we lived under prior to the digital age. That's true. One of my highest health priorities is keeping my brain in top shape. To take care of my brain power, I do many things such as striving to read, write, exercise, and meditate daily. One of the latest tools in my brain power toolkit is MindLab Pro. MindLab Pro is a nootropic supplement that is scientifically proven to enhance your brain power. When I take MindLab Pro, my mind feels like it has a better grip on the world, my thinking is more lucid, and the articulation of my speech is much more clear. MindLab Pro has been tested in rigorous, double-blind, placebo-controlled human trials and has been proven to enhance brain power for users in every age group. MindLab Pro is an advanced formulation of 11 nootropic ingredients and is backed by research from 1,473 human trials conducted over a period of 32 years. So if you're looking to start enhancing your brain power, MindLab Pro is an excellent solution. Go to mindlabpro.com slash breedlove to start enhancing your brain power today. Again, that's mindlabpro.com slash breedlove. Now I'd like to tell you about our sponsor, CrowdHealth. CrowdHealth is a Bitcoin-enabled alternative to legacy health insurance. Now let's face it, legacy health insurance is an absolute scam. Nobody can explain this better than the legendary comedian Chris Rock insurance you got to have some insurance you got to that's an insurance they shouldn't even call it insurance they should just call it in case shit <laughs> like, i give a company some money in case shit happens 
Now, if shit don't happen, shouldn't I get my money back? <laughs> so with CrowdHealth, instead of just paying premiums that you'll never see again, you can hold part of this pool of savings in dollars and in Bitcoin through CrowdHealth. And when you have a health event, you can draw against this pool of communal savings. So go to joincrowdhealth.com slash breedlove to learn more or sign up. Now I'd like to tell you about our sponsor, Wasabi Wallet. With Wasabi Wallet, you can receive, send, and store Bitcoin privately. In Wasabi Wallet, your transaction history and wallet balance are completely hidden. Wasabi Wallet is easy to use. All of its privacy features are built in by default, and it works with any amount of Bitcoin. Wasabi users can make CoinJoin transactions together with BTC Pay server users or Trezor Suite users. For BTC Pay server users, they can make payments directly inside of a CoinJoin. And for Trezor Suite users, you can make CoinJoins directly on a hardware wallet. These features result in the fee savings and security improvements for both sets of users. So go to wasabiwallet.io today to download the state-of-the-art Bitcoin privacy wallet. All right. Um, also from Facebook, Georgie Alexopoulos asks, what would you say to people who view Bitcoin as something people are trying to invest in so they can flee rather than work to try and reverse our current course? Well, Bitcoin may be something people use to flee. I mean, if you're talking about fleeing an oppressive regime or fleeing uh, a hyperinflation, um, then absolutely it can be used as a tool to flee. Uh, that's maybe a negative connotation for saying it's a tool for freedom, right? You can take your the fruits of your labor, right? All of the the things you have accumulated, the economic energy, the purchasing power, whatever term you want to use here, and you can store it in something that's hyper-portable, right, and unconfiscatable. So I think that's not a not a critique of Bitcoin. I would say that's a feature, not a bug. And in saying that it's not something that reforms the current system, I would have to strongly disagree. I mean, every unit of purchasing power that's stored in Bitcoin rather than fiat currency is devitalizing to the state, right? The state can't print Bitcoin as a revenue option. So the more, the more, the higher percentage of global cash balances that are stored in Bitcoin, which is another way of saying the higher Bitcoin's market capitalization becomes, the less state power is, in my opinion, right? Again, this is an organization that derives all of its revenues from non-consensual exchange. It's really hard to steal Bitcoin. It's impossible to inflate and hard to steal. So this, in my mind, is like a check on the predations of the state. And I think that's a, a very important instrument for liberty. And Georgie, I'd also say, uh, you know, of course, Atlas Shrugged, which I hope you've read, um, the, I think, defining theme is about the sanction of the victim and withdrawing the sanction of the victim. That is the entire character arc of Dagny Taggart, uh, trying to fix things, trying to fix uh, her company, trying to fix the world, and then uh, realizing that the deck was stacked against her and that she was sacrificing herself, which is the height of immorality. And so I think um, I, I agree with Robert that this is not a dichotomy at all. Uh, this is not an either or, but um, certainly uh, refusing to be sacrificed, refusing to let your uh, property be be looted um, and uh, fractionally stolen from you is um, is your moral duty to yourself. So. Yes. Uh, all right. Um, now, you said at the very top, talking about your experience with your grandfather, or I think it was your grandfather and his time in the Korean War and his making you uh, promise never to enter the, the military. I, I wanted to cir circle back to that because um, you've posted on X uh, that saving in Bitcoin is voting against war 
Um, I think I see where that's going, but can you lay it out for us? And and does the same dynamic apply also to any government spending that we don't like? Absolutely. I mean, this gets back to the point that I just made. It's if you just imagined a world where everyone's holding their savings in Bitcoin, governments would have absolutely no inflation, right? They couldn't inflate the the monetary base. They couldn't counterfeit currency to steal purchasing power from savers. And therefore there would that would remove a revenue option for states. So as you save more purchasing power in Bitcoin, you are decrementing the ability of the state to fund war via inflation. And this is very important because inflation, like if we look at the the US war on terror, right? I think it, it spanned approximately 20 years. You could say that it's still going on. I think the cost, when I did this analysis, it was a couple of years ago, so the numbers may have changed a bit. Um, I wrote this in, I think, Masters and Slaves of Money. It may have been a different piece. But the, the cost at that time of the war on terror was around $2.5 trillion. And just by coincidence, when I looked to see how much US M2 had expanded during that time, it was $2.8 trillion. All right, so this war on terror, which is more truthfully described as a, a US imperialist campaign, was funded entirely via money printing. And if they didn't have that option, right? If they couldn't if they couldn't inflate and debase the currency to fund the war effort, the US would instead be forced to either borrow or send people tax bills, right? And the numbers on that worked out to I think that 2.5 trillion worked out to like $80,000 per US household. So if you could imagine every U.S. household getting a bill for $80,000 from the U.S. government saying, hey, we're blowing people up on the other side of the world and we need you to pay your fair share. Please send us a check for $80,000. You could imagine how much resistance that would be met with versus the alternative of inflation where you just print the money, wage the war, and then blame the inevitable price inflation, which is the consequence of the monetary inflation, on everything but the central bank, you know? It's Putin's inflation. It's Beyonce's inflation. It's the supply chains. It's this. It's that. Mainstream media will blame inflation on anything and everyone other than the actual root of the problem, which is the legal monopoly on currency counterfeiting that we call central banking. So this this weird, plausible deniability that's built into inflation, I think, is a, a very terrible tool for deception. And if you can remove that element, then it forces governments to be more honest, ultimately, and more explicit in the funding of, of their activities. Um, and to, to maybe tie this back to what we were talking about earlier in terms of communism versus socialism versus capitalism, very important to understand that money printing is theft, right? It is a, it is a way of stealing from savers. And so we, we pride ourselves as free market capitalists in the West, right? We're always talking about the importance of free markets. I was just speaking at the ARC conference here in London, right? Uh, it, which intends to be the anti-world economic forum. And one of the central pillars of ARC is free markets. And so in my panel on the future of money, I said, look, guys, you're up here proclaiming the importance of free markets, but no one is addressing the elephant in the room. There is centrally planned money in every economy in the world. You could fully free and unhamper every single market and you would not achieve a 100% free market because money is one half of every transaction. So if you have totally free markets, but you have a central bank, you have at best a 50% free market. And so this is, and this is Marxist in its roots, right? This is Marx's 1848 manifesto of the communist party Measure number five re reads, the state needs a central monopoly and exclusive monopoly on cash and credit. Like that's a necessity for Marxism or communism to operate. And so standing in, in total contradistinction to that is Bitcoin, right? Bitcoin is a pure free market. Anywhere you can discover cheap energy, well, you can set up a miner and turn that untapped energy resource into money. 
And by extension, by by giving people recourse to this sound savings instrument that's impossible to inflate and hard to steal, it's impressing capitalistic values on every other market in the world. And I just think that is a almost an overwhelming innovation. So, um, you know, Bitcoin has had a great year, even a, a great last month. Um, what do you attribute that to? I mean, I think there's a, a, what really has a lot of people uh, skittish about investing is the is the volatil- volatility. So, um, what do you attribute the the recent um, upsurge? Is it uh, news about the pending approval of a Bitcoin uh, exchange traded fund? What other factors might be playing a role? Yeah, I'm always very skittish to ascribe narratives to short-term market moves because Mm -hmm. it's kind of the purpose of the market, right? It's to sort out collective psychology and just generate the price, tell us what the thing costs, and that's all the information we really need. Um, I am, that said, I am still a subscriber to the having. You know, every four years, the natural sellers of Bitcoin are basically cut in half. Uh, miners that are mining Bitcoin, uh, they're they're earning Bitcoin as their revenue. They're selling a lot of it to pay for their capital and operational expenditures. Every four years, the new issuance of Bitcoin declines by 50%. So that natural selling of Bitcoin is cut in half. So if you hold demand constant, that obviously puts upward pe- pressure on the price. And this is something we know with perfect certainty when these, not perfect, approximate certainty when these halvings occur. They occur every four years, um, but it has to do with the block time as as of the exact date. And so we've seen this cycle repeat where last time I looked at this, I think it's roughly 510 days after each Bitcoin halving, it hits a new all-time high price. So how many times does that cycle need to repeat before people start to front run this asset, right? When you just you're rationalizing, right? It's okay. The money printing is not going to stop. The quantitative easing is not going to stop. The quantitative tightening of Bitcoin is not going to stop. What happens when you denominate a quantitatively tightening asset in terms of a quantitatively easing asset, fiat currency? Well, you get a higher dollar price of Bitcoin effectively. So I, I think that's a, a big driver there's kind of a, a systemic driver of, of Bitcoin's number go up technology, as we like to say. But then there's also all these other narratives, right? Institutional adoption, BlackRock buying Bitcoin, ETF, opening up more channels for capital to flow into this asset. I think these are all important, but I can't, I, I, I hesitate to give you any specific narrative for why Bitcoin has performed well over the past month. All right. Well, we yeah we have a little less than ten minutes left. There was a couple of things I wanted to to get to, and apologies to all of you who asked questions that we're not going to be able to uh, to cover. But um, you made I thought a pretty startling prediction in one of your interviews. Uh, you said that the U.S. dollar will hyperinflate by twenty thirty five. Do you still believe that? And, and what do you base it on? Yeah. So. Those who live by the crystal ball are bound to eat glass. So um, <laughs> caveat and tour, it's just a prediction um, of mine. Um, I would also say that, well, I'll first explain the prediction. So I looked at the rate of hyperinflations historically, and uh, there's a book called Fiat Currency Inflation in France, and it talks about this law of accelerating issuance and depreciation. So every time you print money, right, you're debasing the currency, you're incentivizing others, market actors, to accumulate more debt because you can borrow strong dollars and pay back weaker dollars over time. So fiat currency is incentivizing indebtedness. This causes credit expansions, right? And so when you print a round of money, you're basically blowing another credit bubble And then when that bubble bursts, you have exponentially more liabilities than you did that spurred the last round of printing. So the next round of printing is typically exponentially larger to try and and shore up these liabilities. And for a simple example of this, 
In 2008, we printed $700 billion. That was an astronomical figure at the time. Well, in 2020, we printed almost 10x that, right? Somewhere in the neighborhood of six to eight trillion dollars. So I think, um, and you know, this gets into like Austrian business cycle theory. Each round of printing is sowing the seeds for more credit expansion, like an expo- uh, an exponential, exponentially more credit expansion, and every credit bust necessitates exponentially more money printing. So if you just play this out, I think we're probably one to two economic crises away before the U.S. dollar hyperinflates, which I estimated to be you know roughly 15 years out. Now, to counter my own prediction, there's this strange um, countervailing phenomenon, which is we're rapidly expanding human productivity through digital technologies and innovation. The more we expand human productivity, the more runway we can actually give the fiat system, right? The more economic surplus we are generating through through technological advance, there's more economic surplus that can be harvested by the printing of money. So I could be very wrong, right? It it depends kind of how fast productivity advances relative to how fast the money is being debased. I'm not sure which one of these tectonic forces is going to win out. Um, But I- Where does- uh Where does China's plan for a digital yuan fit into that future scenario? Well, I think that, you know, central bank digital currencies are basically fiat currencies on steroids, right? So not only will they be able to tax you directly out of your bank account, they'll also be able to survey you. Um, It's a prerequisite to a social credit score system. So it's, it's escalating the oppression of government in a very serious way. I don't think it will do much to stop the printing of money, though, because again, this this ship has already kind of been sailed, right? It's it's not. I don't see governments reversing course on it, uh, especially given the the levels of of national indebtedness. So, I would like to think that any attempts to roll out a CBDC in other parts of the world, specifically in the West, will be met with fierce resistance. Um, but either way the money printing is not going to stop. So I don't think the CBDC will have, have much uh, effect on that front. Um, one almost final question. I understand you've met with RFK Jr. Is there a declared candidate? Um, I know you've also flirted with, with the idea of, of making a run, but uh, when you look at the field as it now stands, who which candidates are uh, the most Bitcoin friendly uh-huh. or uh, at yeah. least uh, any candidates that are talking about the issues that, that you're talking about today? I should first talk about my flirtation with running for president. I actually put it out as a joke, a tweet. I think I said, um, I'll happily run for U.S. president on a platform of 0% taxation. Who's with me? It was really... I was, actually joking. But then the Libertarian Party was reaching out to me like, are you serious? Let's do this, et cetera. So uh, I don't actually have any political ambitions. I'm not, of all the things that disinterest me, I think politics is at the top of the list. Obviously, it's a reality that we inhabit. But what really excites me about Bitcoin is that maybe we can wake up from this delusion that we need to be politically coerced to be organized as a, as a species. I just don't think it's necessary. Uh, obviously politics, I would define politics as the art of survival inside of human hierarchies. What I would like to see is those human hierarchies to be, be to be based more on competence and less on coercion. So more free markets, less state. Um, but in terms of the reality we're in today, I, I very much appreciate that RFK is talking about Bitcoin and talking about the problems of money printing. And he's, you know, flirting with the idea of creating um, U.S. Treasury instruments that are backed by commodities, you know, gold, Bitcoin, etc. These are all good things, right? Just to get the idea to permeate the collective consciousness a bit more. And if the U.S. were to embrace Bitcoin, I think this starts to... to 
help us reverse course, right? We kind of can get back to our foundational values as a constitutional republic that honors life, liberty, and property and has, you know, low to no taxes, very predictable and solid rules. And we are we would then live in a world that's led by entrepreneurial elites rather than political elites. So it sounds like a, a future I would I would be voting for. Exactly. Yes. And the vote and the voting thing I don't think voting's that effective. I mean it is at the at the fringes, but ultimately I think money is the most important voting system, right? When you buy something, you tell the market to make more of it. When you sell something, you tell the market to make less of it. That's what really determines the reality that we inhabit. And I think we can radically increase human productivity to the same extent that we decrease systematic theft via inflation and taxation. I think uh, I think both are important. I don't think it's an either or, um, but I agree that uh, voting with your assets is something that we don't talk about enough. Finally, tell us a little bit about Parallax Digital. What kind of services does it provide? Yeah, I don't do much with Parallax anymore. Uh, before getting into the space, I was operating a, a hedge fund, and so that was under the Parallax umbrella. Uh, I also do some consulting work there. Um, less these days. I'm much more focused on education and the podcast, writing, public speaking. Um, so yeah, I would say if if you want to stay current with me and my work, I would just check out whatismoneypodcast.com. That's where I'm I'm doing most of my work these days. Fantastic. And follow you on Twitter and definitely check out his video uh, about Francisco's money speech. It's really breathtaking and uh, Thank you. appreciated learning a little bit about the artistic Uh, creativity that went into it, because I think that also made it very, very powerful. So thank you, Robert. Really appreciate your joining us uh, from the evening over there in the UK and hope to see you back in Southern California soon. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you having me.